Good evening and welcome to the Monday, August 23rd, 2021 meeting of the Hillsborough Township Board of Education. In accordance with the state Sunshine Law of New Jersey, adequate notice of this meeting of the Hillsborough Township Board of Education was provided on August 19th, 2021 to the Hillsborough Beacon and the Courier News. Mr. Mahmoud, may we have a roll call, please? Mr. Gillette? Mr. Kidd? Mr. Marini? Here. Mrs. Maroon? Here. Mrs. Nurse? Here. Mr. Oliver? Present. Mr. Pulsifer? Mrs. Stats? Here. And Ms. Trinia? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Maroon. Now, may I have a motion to move into executive session and I'll give the notice. It says, whereas the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231 of the Laws of 1975, provides that a public body may exclude the public from that portion of the meeting of which the public body discusses certain matters for which confidentiality is required as permitted in Section 7B of the Act. Resolved by the Board of Education of the Township of Hillsborough and the County of Somerset and State of New Jersey as follows. One, matters to be discussed are personnel matters. Two, the matters discussed in the executive session shall be disclosed to the public when the need for confidentiality no longer exists. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Marini, and thank you, Mr. Oliver. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, any opposed? Okay, so we're now in executive session. We expect to return at 7.30. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to again to the Monday, August 23rd, 2021 meeting of the Hillsborough Township Board of Education. We are back now from executive session. Mr. Mahmoud, may we have a roll call, please? Surely. Mr. Gillette? Mr. Kidd? Mr. Marini? Thank you. Mrs. Maru? Here. Thank you. Mrs. Nurse? Here. Thank you. Mr. Oliver? Here. Thank you. Mr. Pulsifer? Mrs. Stats? Here. And Ms. Trujillo? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Mahmoud. May we please now rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. I would like to acknowledge the correspondence as listed and also to let my fellow board members know and the public that I have responded to the emails. If I've missed any that you um, have seen, please let me know that I may address them. And then next, I would like to go to, we're going to move the agenda around just a little bit, go to the approval of the public minutes from July 19th. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Marini. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Mahmoud. Then I would like to now move to committee reports, and Mr. Gillette is not here tonight, so we will report on operations at the September meeting. If I could have Ms. Maroon with the education minutes. Sure. Um, the education committee met on August 19th, 2021. Um, we had a number of action items that you'll see on the agenda tonight, including the revised curriculum, the CTE standards, the bridge year pilot program, and school district travel. Um, again, it's all listed in the um, on the agenda tonight. And then we also had some discussions on the PDP and the SOA mentoring plan. Again, you can see that on the, on the agenda tonight. The district board goals, the HMS Hershey trip, and um, projected enrollment. And that was pretty much it, right? Thank you, Ms. Maroon. Mr. Oliver, may we have the HR committee minutes? So the HR committee met on August 19th. Uh, all members were present. We uh, discussed some action items which will be on the agenda tonight for first reading. Uh, they are policy changes which are regulation changes or uh, date specific statute changes. Uh, we did look at um, some staff uh, changes and uh, non-affiliated uh, raises. Uh, we discussed the vacancy at the Woods Road School which will be on the agenda tonight for a new principal. We discussed some changes to the coaching matrix uh, and how we're going to move forward in uh, evaluating our coaches and specific dates for when they'll need to be evaluated. And sick bank leave request and some personnel matters. Robust meeting and a lot accomplished. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. And Ms. Stats, did you have an 
ESC report? Uh, yes. Um, uh, the ESC met on August 4th. Uh, but before I talk about that, um, I attended their, uh, their ceremony for their graduating seniors in, in June, and it was really, it was really uh, very moving because it obviously could be more intimate because there's uh, uh, fewer students, but a lot of them uh, had uh, accomplished so much and uh, were going on to uh, uh, even greater things to accomplish. So it was, it was a really great ceremony. Um, but um, at, at the ESC meeting on August 4th, they talked about the different programs, the Pathways Academy for uh, young 18 to 21 year olds uh, after they graduate. Um, and there's a new DAWN program that addresses the needs of students with mental health issues. Um, and they had a su summer co community service program called Grow a Row, where they uh, um, uh, picked uh, zucchini. And at least in my experience, I think a lot of other people's experiences, uh, zucchini can be like, I guess like rabbits. I mean, it, it, it really can uh, uh, expand greatly. But uh, that was a very successful program. And um, uh, uh, some of us were given a tour of, of the building and uh, the, not only what they've accomplished so far in the facility, but what their plans are. So it's pretty exciting. And also, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what we've talked about before, a program that's supported by the Municipal Alliance um, called Bridge to Success. And it's uh, an eight-week uh, virtual program for young adults ages 18 to 24. Um, our our uh, district provides a lot of services and uh, support from the staff while they're here. And uh, we noticed um, some of our young adults struggle. So we were trying desperately to do something to address that. So that that's a, hopefully this, this program will help them. So we're hoping that people can uh, spread the word. Um, it'll be, like I said, it's eight weeks of virtual meetings, one hour a week from September 21st to November 9th. And uh, they'll learn problem solving skills and uh, how to deal with certain uh, uh, stress related issues. And uh, there's information that's on the table over there when you first come in through those doors and um, how to register. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Thank you, Ms. Stats. So, as I said earlier, we're going to move the agenda around a little bit. We're going to do the action agenda, agenda next. But before we do that, we will open it up for comments from the public on items on the action agenda before the board votes. So, we very much welcome input from the public. During board meetings, there will be two 30-minute periods of time that the meeting will be open for public comment. Members of the public are invited to comment, which they may... All right. We don't need that. Um, during the first public comment period, members of the public may comment about items that are listed on tonight's agenda. If, so we're going to, okay, so we're just going to do public comments on items on the agenda for this period. Then before you state your question or comment, actually before you state your comment, you will be asked to provide your name and address. Please understand that our public forums are not structured as question and answer sessions, but rather <laughs> are offered as opportunities to share your thoughts with the board. In instances where the board believes there is a misunderstanding or inaccuracy, the board president or superintendent will address the comment. There may be times when a member of the public makes a comment or asks a question about personnel or hiring decisions. Kindly note that the Open Public Meetings Act and the privacy rights of public employees encompassed therein do not permit the board to discuss personnel issues in public session. And so with that, I'm opening the public comment session, section for items on the action agenda only. Thank you. May I comment on something that should have been on the agenda? I can make it real quick. Um, what, can you please put your mask back on and then also, what is the question? Hi, may I comment on something that should have been on the agenda? No, um, no, no? We're, okay. no because we're only comments on what we're voting on. Got it, thank you. But there will be a second public comment period where you may address the board. Any other comments from the public on the action agenda before we vote? Seeing none, I will now close public comments and turn it over to the superintendent for, oh, yes, Ms. Stats. Can the board make comments? Oh, sure. Um, so I will now open it up to the board, Ms. Stats. Um, it just came up during the education committee meeting that um, we are uh, eliminating two 
Oh, I hope I'm correct in saying this, that we're eliminating two uh, teaching positions in the elementary grades. And I'm concerned because two years ago we lost over 30 positions. Um, so now we're losing even two more on top of that. Um, yes, I understand that enrollment has reduced, but it's in addition to the over 30 that we lost on top of that and the fact that we did have in the budget to hire additional teachers, um, I find that troubling. Um, and I just wanted to uh, make people aware of that. Thank you, Ms. Stats. Dr. Antunas? I just want to clarify, we did not eliminate two teachers. The class sizes are, most of them are below, and those that are at are, are fully, fully staffed. So it wasn't, we didn't take two teachers and eliminate them. There was, there was no reason to, to it, was, it was enrollments at this point. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that it wasn't an, an elimination like if, we love, like if we lost state aid and we had to cut teachers different. That's all. Oh, I understand. Okay, but, I just uh, wanted to make sure. And, and I understand understood. that you had a reason for it, um, but I, I see nothing wrong with welcoming lower class sizes. Um, of course, it might involve shuffling, but we definitely in, saw an increase in class sizes a couple years ago. We had over 30 staff members. A significant number of them were elementary school teachers, so uh, that affects class size, and the lower the class size, the better it is for our students. Thank you, Ms. Stats. Any other comments from the board? Um, sir, public comments is now closed. There'll be a second period for public it comment. It wasn't closed. She, she commented as a public member. This is the board is commenting. So I close public comments okay. and then the board. You will have a second opportunity at the end, at the later. Any other comments from the board? All right, seeing none, Dr. Antunes, if we could have the action agenda. Thank you. We'll be moving this as a consensus agenda. I will read through everything with note to the board that there were two items added as discussed in executive session. Motion to approve the profession, uh, the uh, superintendent recommends that the Board of Education approve the education agenda 10.1 to 10.11, the HR agenda 11.1 to 11.19, and the operations agenda 12.1 to 12.3 as follows. Motion to approve professional travel related expenses. Motion to approve staff member being paid by IDEA, FY22 funds. Motion to approve revised curriculum. Motion to approve staff being paid by FY22 ESEA Title I funds. Motion to submit the 21-22 Statement of Assurance for District Professional Development, as well as the District Mentoring Plan. Motion to approve staff for the ELL program and curriculum writing. Motion to approve staff to administer the measure of develop uh, the model proficiency assessments during the summer months. Motion to approve stipends for reorientation program for students. Motion to approve policies and regs for first reading as listed. Motion to approve retirements and resignations, and I'd like to Congratulate Kristen O'Leary, who's been with us for 17 years as a lunch aide at Woodfern. We thank her for her service. Motion to rescind the appointment as listed and approve contract changes as listed. Motion to approve tra transfer, change in assignments, and revise leaves of absences. Motion to approve leaves of absence and appointments as listed. Motion to affirm appointments and to approve practicum placements. Motion to approve extra coverage, to approve sixth and seventh period coverage, and it, to approve science lab coverage. Motion to approve summer, revise summer work hours, approve group changes as listed, and the renewal of the assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction, as well as the renewal of the business administrator board secretary. Motion to approve policies and regulations for first reading as listed, as well as to abolish the policy as listed. Motion to approve the settlement agreement. Okay. Motion to approve the settlement agreement as indicated and discussed in executive session. Motion to approve monthly financial statements and the bills. Motion to approve the policies and regs for first reading as listed. That is it. Thank you, Dr. Antunes. May I have a motion and a second? Thank you, Mr. Bosworth. Second. Thank you, Ms. Maroon. Any discussion? Ms. Stats. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, I think it's a, it's a loss for our district, that anybody resigns, but especially uh, Ms. Wargo, because uh, I believe it was three years ago she was Teacher of the Year, District Teacher of the Year, County Teacher of the Year. She's very dynamic. Um, 
I, I was going through the Leadership Somerset program that year, and she came and spoke to us. She's just, oh, she's so inspirational. So uh, it will be, it'll be a loss to our district because she was so powerful with, uh, with her, her uh, students with special needs. Thank you, Ms. Stotts. Any other comments before we vote? Oh. Oh. After we vote? Okay. Yes. Okay. Any other comments? Um, seeing none, if we could have a roll call, Mr. Mahmood. Surely. Mr. Marini? Uh, yes. Thank you. Mrs. Maroon? Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Nurse? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Oliver? Yes. Mr. Pulsifer? Uh, yes. With the exception of abstaining on 11.3. Thank you, got it. Thank you, Mr. Postman. Mrs. Stats? Yes. And Ms. Trujillo? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Mahmood. And I would like to welcome and acknowledge um, the new principal of Woods Road School, who's in the audience with us today, um, Mr. T.R. Rapien. Thank you. Um, I will now turn it over to Dr. Antunes for the superintendent's report. Thank you. Uh, we do have uh, Ms. Smedley here to discuss the 2019-2020 Hibbs School Self-Assessment Grade Reporting that we, that we complete in June. And you have heard this before, but it is a, it is a requirement, and so she's here to, to discuss that quickly with everybody. Good evening. So I just wanted to go through, this is the annual HIB reporting uh, self-assessment grades for the 2019-2020 school year. So not this school year, but the school year before. Um, nothing too notable, and I guess this will be an attachment for public. Um, I'm sorry. I, I think it's an attachment on the public agenda. Yes. Um, so our grades have remained the same. Um, these are grades given by the, um, in conjunction with the school safety and climate team, um, teams at each of our nine schools. Um, the grades have remained pretty consistent. The only thing that I think is of note on this is you'll see that the score um, gives the possible scores. The score at the high school for the 1920 school year was significantly lower than the other reported scores. And um, that was really entirely based on the fact that when we uh, left school on March 13th to be all virtual, we weren't able to um, complete two investigations that had just started. One started on that day, one started. So on the morning of March 13th, we had um, a suspected incident. And with our adjustment to online learning and being home, we weren't able to complete those. Um, investigations until the summer so we didn't meet the the um, the grade reporting for the possible all the possible points because of our timeline so those were completed the board heard those last summer in July um, and so and this same report was given the state had us report on two years ago I anticipate that probably either sometime during this school year or next summer I'll report on the 2020 2021 school year okay. thank you Ms. Murray. you're welcome Okay, I wanted to share the board and district goals for the year. The board met for goal setting, public, public meeting goal setting on June 23rd, 2021. And out of that evening came these, the goals that I'm gonna share this evening. District goal is to implement and refine current communication system structures and processes within Hillsborough Township School District to result in consistent internal and external communications. To continue to promote multicultural awareness, gender sensitivity, and an appreciation of the diversity in the community. To return students to school full time and provide all necessary support, academic and social emotional for students and staff to acclimate and be successful. A board goal, the board will work toward improving board governance practices and increasing committee and board effectiveness. And the board will develop a plan to improve and enhance communications with all stakeholders. Additionally, the board will focus on intra-board communications. That is what was discussed. We will then have action plans drawn up once the board, which will probably be on the next agenda in September, approve these goals, we'll draw up action plans, and then we'll work toward accomplishing them. I don't know if there are any questions or comments from the 
Are there any comments or questions from the board members? Mr. Marini. Yeah, I, I know we had discussed during the open session around goal around uh, cybersecurity improvement, and I know it was discussed and recommended to be left off. I still feel it should be on uh, the goals for the year because um, it was a highlight of this year and discussed numerous times. Thank you, Mr. Marini. Any other comments from the board? Okay, seeing none. Okay. I'm going to do a, f a formal presentation, as you see up on the screen, Successful September. Before that, I'd like to just say a couple words about other things as well. I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone in the community who took time out of their busy schedules to join me and, and Mr. Mahmood and some board members and other administrators in the district for the two Q&As that were held last Thursday. The conversations uh, helped me to understand the concerns in the community and hopefully answered many questions as we prepare for the full day opening of schools for students and staff in just a couple, couple weeks. It has always been our intention to keep families informed of any changes that occur related to COVID-19 and will continue in this endeavor as the new school year starts. I am sure everyone is already aware of Governor Murphy's Executive Order Number 251 requiring masks and indoor premises of all schools, which was effective Monday, August 9th. At this time, you'll hear me say that a lot, at this time, Vaccinations are not required for eligible students. We do, however, ask if your child is vaccinated to please notify the school nurse. This will assist us in contact tracing for our <coughs> school nurses. Just this afternoon, at Governor Murphy's weekly COVID press screening, press briefing, he announced that all individuals employed by the Board of Education must be vaccinated by October 18th or submit to COVID testing at a minimum of once or twice per week. He's expected to sign an executive order to this effect. Once we have the executive order, we share additional information. This, again, this changes constantly. Additionally, I would like to remind parents and students that as athletics and extracurricular activities have started and as the school year begins, we will most definitely have positive COVID-19 cases that may require to pe people to be excluded from school, practices and games while contact tracing is completed. While it is always our intention to do this as quickly as possible, if information is received late in the day or during a weekend, information may not be available until the following workday. However, our principals are very good at looking at their emails throughout the evening, and if there is something, it's possible that the community will get reasonable um, people within the community, whoever it affects, will get an, uh, a school messenger phone call late at night, 9.30, 10 o'clock even, if, if necessary, if we know at that point. The reason for that is because oftentimes the results are not coming into our parents until later, or maybe that's when our parents or our staff members have a moment to sit down and look at their email. Uh, I'm gonna talk about quarantine reminders and exclusions, so I'm gonna talk about in the presentation, so you will see that. Tomorrow, August 24th at 10 a.m., Genesis access for student schedules will be turned on for the 21-22 school year for students and staff in grades five through 12. Schedules for students in grades preschool through grade four may be accessed on Friday, August 27th at 3 p.m. Transportation information will be available for all students on Friday, August 27th at 4 p.m. Please recheck your child's bus schedule just prior to the start of school to make sure you're the most up-to-date information. And on behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to take a moment to welcome our new teachers to Hillsborough. Today was the start of new teacher orientation where we welcomed many new teachers to district. It was an exciting time. They, they were here in this room and it was exciting just to be with each other. These new teachers, are, teachers and staff members are joining an elite group of professionals working for a common purpose to provide our students with, out, with an outstanding education. We wish each and every new teacher not only a successful first year in Hillsborough, but also a rewarding, fulfilling career with us. Now I'd like to move forward with um, the more formal presentation. Most of this is exactly what we've talked about, what we've been talking about the last several weeks. There are some changes based upon CDC updates or school physician updates, but I just want to begin the conversation with a statement about good intentions. We all have good intentions. We all want the same thing, or likely the same thing. Someone pointed out that maybe we don't all want the same thing at the last um, presentation, and that is our premise is that we are coming to school, getting kids in school, healthfully and safely, students and staff. 
and keeping them there. That is, that is our priority. But we all, we all want to be here. This is a very divisive situation that we, are all find, we all find ourselves in. Everybody has experienced COVID very differently and very individually. People are fearful and uncertain. We are all experiencing things and going through this together. Our experiences may be different, they may be similar, but we are all going through this together. So becoming combative or, or disrespectful does not move the conversation forward and does not help anybody within the community. This has split the world, it has split communities, it has split families. So we want to keep this as respectful as possible, please. So I've started each of my presentations to the public this way. We are planning for full five days, we are planning on lunches, and we are trying to maintain three feet to the greatest extent possible. In some cases, that will not be possible. <coughs> We continue our core committee meetings. We've had sometimes two a week. We continue our grade band committee meetings and we've had spring into summer events. We're continuing these events. We're continuing to put, our, put ourselves out there to speak to people. I've called people personally. I know Mr. Mahmoud has, Mr. Trujillo has. We've, uh, I have a focus group going on tomorrow. So we continue these community events. Let's remember that schools do have a mixed population of vaccinated and unvaccinated people. We have, for whatever reason, students, staff members who maybe can't be vaccinated or are, are ineligible to be vaccinated, but we do have a mix of people. Our premise is that those who attend school are well and are following the guidelines and criteria set forth. You may disagree, you may agree. Our role is to ensure that the guidelines set forth by the governor, the New Jersey Department of Education, et cetera, are followed. Everyone, our premise is that everyone will cooperate and comply with contact tracing as necessary and appropriate. If a nurse or Department of Health officer reaches out and you choose not to answer the phone, that, that's not helping anybody. Decision making regarding COVID-19 prevention strategies are based upon protecting those who are not or cannot be fully vaccinated. Our priority is opening schools and keeping them open. That is our priority. That may mean that we have to shut down classes, have to shut down programs, have to shut down a school, have to shut down a sport. That's what we'll do. We will follow, Hillsborough Township Public Schools will follow any governor of New Jersey executive orders, New Jersey state agency mandates, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention guidance, New Jersey statute or administrative code requiring compliance by the school district on providing or requiring vaccinations to educators, other staff, or students. We will continue to consult with our local health official and school physician on all matters pertaining to vaccination, including sharing information on how to obtain vaccines and possibly hosting opportunities if, if necessary. With the construction, it's been a little difficult for us to do that. There are school, as you know, do have a mask mandate, but there are also exceptions to that mandate as listed. The mask mandate does apply to private, public, private, and parochial preschools, elementary, and secondary schools with some limited exceptions as listed. And it is likely that outdoor masks may be recommended or required at some point. However, we're not willing to, to put that out there at this time. We're waiting to see that could happen right before school starts. It could happen once school starts. We just don't know. But the exemptions are outlined. So this changed a little bit uh, from the last presentation. And as, as we just said, masks are required for everyone, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated at all times while indoors. We suspect that the guidelines will be subject to change. If we find ourselves in a sustained period of low, then we might relax the mask mandates for vaccinated individuals. If we find that we're remaining in moderate or high for an extended period of time, then we might have to in implement more restrictions. But we do have a layered mitigation approach that we've been utilizing since we went out. Masking is required at all times when we're in moderate or higher. That's not to say that if we're in low for a week, we're gonna relax the, the mandate. 
We'll take a look. We'll see if we can sustain this. Not we, Hillsboro, just the state, our region, and if, as the case may be, Hillsboro is doing pretty well, then we'll look at that as well. If you're vaccinated and you are exposed, there is no quarantine required. You may continue to participate in extracurricular and athletic activities. If you're unvaccinated and you're exposed, quarantine is required and you may not participate or your children may not participate in extracurricular athletic activities. We talked about eliminating or relaxing the requirement to complete the daily COVID screening form. As long as we are in moderate or higher, we will continue moving forward with that. That is a recommendation that we will keep in place. And that goes for, for students and staff members. Uh, the CDC, Dr. Mandelbaum, Somerset County Department, uh, Somerset County and local departments of health uh, continue to speak with us. We have almost weekly meetings with Somerset County superintendents where in the last several meetings, the Somerset County and local departments of health have been a part of that call. And Dr. Mandelbaum is always available for, for texting or conversations as questions come up. We can treat extracurricular activities and athletics differently, meaning that if there's, there's actually a recommendation out there by our health officers to mandate vaccinations for students to be permitted to participate in athletics and extracurricular activities, we're not, we're not making that recommendation at this time, although I have to tell you that might be taken out of our hands just as the masking was taken out of our hands, but we are not recommending that at this time. We haven't seen any district do that quite yet, so we're, we're just keeping an eye on that. Breakthrough cases due to athletics and extracurricular activities will shut down programs. We've already had to shut down a couple programs for a couple of days while we were doing contact tracing. We will shut down those programs. And any generalized breakthrough cases will obviously close classrooms, schools for contact tracing for any period of time. We just don't know. So we just have to all be prepared to shift on a dime as if necessary. There are many, many challenges we are all facing. Our staff, our building administrators, our district administrators, and our teachers are really doing a fabulous job in trying to work it through. Are we gonna have everything worked through? We'd like to believe we are, but something might come up that we're gonna have to deal with and work through, and we will do that. Lunch is one of the biggest challenges. If there was a mandate to maintain six feet at lunch, we wouldn't be able to come back to school full time. It would be impossible for us to do that. That is not the case. However, that is going to be a time where we're going to be extra vigilant because students will not be six feet apart without masks. So that's a time that, that the principals and the building administrators are working with our food services people and our maintenance and custodial crews to ensure that the cleaning takes place as soon as possible, which is actually quite quickly, and that in lunches there are assigned seats, that we have sign-in sheets. Might look a little bit different at each school because each school is configured differently and the number of students in lunches is configured differently, but these things are important because of contact tracing reasons. Any transportation protocols, all school buses are considered school property in terms of the need for prevention strategies. So social distancing will be maintained to the greatest extent possible. It depends, we may have some routes that we can maintain three feet, we may have many that do not. We suspect that we'll have parents drop off their children at the beginning of the school year anyway, so we'll see how that goes. Just like last year, students will load from the back to the front so that students, uh, with first students sitting in the rear, so I'm getting on the bus first, I'm gonna go right to the back, and then the people who are sitting in the front of the bus will get off that way. Masks must be worn by all students, drivers, and aides on buses, regardless of vaccination status, as per the CDC order. Again, accommodations for those who are unable to wear face coverings will be addressed according to the student's needs. We'll be sure to place signage on district buses to communicate that face coverings should be worn. Again, these are, not, these are not new things to us. These are all things we've been doing. We've established a protocol which will be communicated to parents prior to the start of the school year, outlining expectations of students wearing face coverings, and there will be soft shields surrounding bus drivers. 
We will disinfect our district buses and vans with electrostatic sprayers after morning runs and in the afternoon. To the greatest extent possible, additional cleaning will be done between runs. That's not always possible. Our vendors for our contracted buses will attest to and sign contracts that their cleaning procedures are in place and that drivers are wearing face coverings. Just a note, hand sanitizers and other chemicals cannot be stationed on buses because they're flammable. So we can't have those things on buses. We, we got some questions about that, so I wanted to be sure to make that clear. Air filters will be removed and clean every day on buses for students with special needs. Right now, there will be no field trips. Is that to say that there will be no field trips all year? Absolutely not. Right now, in the beginning of the school year, perhaps through the, the holiday break, there will be no field trips. Any transportation for any extracurricular activities, including athletics, marching band, academic, academic teams, will be guided by our organizations, and we'll see how that goes. We will follow any guidelines from the NJSIAA on the athletic plan, which may be impacted depending upon how many districts in the state are having issues related to COVID. There might not be enough players to play a game with. And student athletes, coaches, and drivers will be required to wear face coverings. I will tell you that at the scrimmage on Saturday, I was there, and the, the coaches were wearing the masks on the sidelines, the students were wearing, the players were wearing masks on the sidelines. When they were actually playing, they weren't wearing the mask, but all the other times they were. In terms of cleaning, disinfection, and airflow, we do have established schedules for increased cleaning and disinfection, as well as targeted areas. And those targeted areas typically include frequently touched surfaces and objects. Restrooms may be closed throughout the day for 20 to 30 minutes for additional cleaning. We did this last year as well, but we had fewer kids in school. So we'll, we'll, it'll be on a rotation basis. That doesn't mean that all bathrooms will be closed at all times. It will be a rotation of bathrooms that may be closed. And as we've done in the past, disinfecting materials will be made available for utilization in classrooms. Hand sanitizing stations will be provided throughout the district. And there will be isolation in COVID areas in nurses' offices, which will be cleaned and sanitized after each use, as well as daily. Water fountains will be turned off, like the bubblers, but the water filling stations will be available. And kitchens obviously will be cleaned according to the, the usage and using the disinfecting plan as submitted by our food services company. Catholic Charities has developed our after school, before and after school program, has developed a cleaning schedule for before and after school program, and they've agreed to follow our guidelines and protocols as well. We have invested in HVAC repairs and upgrades and exhaust fans throughout the district for improved ventilation. Some of that was attached to the referendum, some of it was additional. We will improve circulation of outdoor air, increase the delivery of clean air, and dilute potential contaminants through several strategies like bringing in as much outdoor air as possible, opening windows and doors as long as it's safe to do so, in school buses, in schools and on buses, utilize exhaust fans and ceiling fans when possible. So in terms of contact tracing, the CDC still identifies a close contact as someone who is within six feet of an infected person for a cumulative total of 15 minutes or more over 24 hours. However, they have an exception for K-12 classrooms. Now they have to have this exception if they expect everybody to come back to school. And this is exactly taken verbatim from the CDC website. In the K, and I'm, go and I'm going to read it. In the K-12 indoor classroom setting, the close contact definition excludes students who were within three to six feet of an infected <coughs> student. If both the infected student and the exposed students correctly and consistently wore well-fitting masks the entire time. So if, a student, if students are wearing masks properly, then contact tracing will take place three feet or less. Anything beyond three feet, contact tracing does not have to take place. So this is just a little, a little summary. So six feet or three feet with masks for 15 minutes or more. We will utilize as much space as we're reasonably able to utilize. And again, the principals have been working on this with our buildings and grounds crew and our teachers for months now. Seating charts will be essential to assist in contact tracing. Seating charts on buses, seating charts at lunches. However the principal decides, 
he's here, they want to move forward with ensuring that when contact tracing has to occur, it will be done as efficiently as possible. And I've said it before, I want to continue to say this, parents must have alternate plans available at a moment's notice, especially for our students who can't stay home alone. We must have alternate plans available. So some quarantine reminders and guidelines, and this is going to be available on the website tomorrow. Also expect a school messenger from us within the next several days following tonight. So we are follow following the CDC guidelines, and we, are, we happen to be in the central west region. Somerset County is in the central west region, so we're looking at all of these things. For unvaccinated individuals, when we are in the low to moderate range, we are currently in the moderate range, if you're unvaccinated and you've been exposed, you must quarantine for seven days with a negative test on day five or later, or 10 days of quarantine. If we're in the high range, then it's 10 to 14 days of quarantine for the unvaccinated individual. For the vaccinated individual, you do not need to quarantine after contact with someone who has COVID-19 unless you are symptomatic. Fully vaccinated people are encouraged to get tested three to five days after exposure, even if you don't have symptoms. There might be a vaccination testing mandate lying ahead. Now, this is this I did over the weekend and this morning it changed. Honestly, I've been in meetings all day, back to back, so I didn't even have a chance to update this. But I did this over the weekend, and here we are. So we know that there's the possibility of vaccination and testing mandate for school personnel now. That just came out today. So at the time, this is something that the governor said he was working on, and we don't have any guidance yet or no guidelines about it, just that it's, got, it's going to happen. I want to be very clear about this. There is no virtual option. If school is closed for whatever reason by a, a, a declaration of emergency by the governor's office or the Department of Ed, then we, and schools are closed, districts are closed, we will shift to virtual option. But there is not a virtual option at this time for students who are quarantined or, who, or for students who choose, whose parents choose not to send them to school. We are not mandating at this time that our teachers provide synchronous instruction. If a teacher feels that he, she, or they want a student to listen to them during the actual lesson, they'll invite the student to join. But at this time, we're not mandating that. That's not to say that teachers will not follow up with their, with their students, especially if they know they're on quarantine. They will absolutely do that. That is not to say that as a parent or students themselves cannot reach out to teachers. They absolutely can do that, and the teachers will be responsive. That is where we are at the moment. Um, questions come in all the time. I try to highlight those things that, we, that people keep asking, and uh, we, will, we will, I think there was a question about an FAQ. We are developing another FAQ with the questions that the board is getting and that we're getting and this will be on the website as i said probably tomorrow and uh, be on the lookout for school messenger also understand that as we get information you will get information it changes all the time and we are all working around the clock to ensure that our students and staff come to school we're, we're all excited to be here so come to school and have the safest environment that we can provide for everybody Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. Thank you, Dr. Antunes, for that update on successful September. And also, thank you very much for hosting the two Q&A sessions on Thursday, August 19th. And I will now turn it to the board if there are any questions or comments. Is this Ms. just Stats? about the report or anything? Um, just about the report. <clears throat> Excuse me? About the successful oh. September. OK. Um, seeing none. Then I will now open it up to the public for the second public comment period. Um, so if you'd like to address the board, you may do so on any topic. Hi. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Dieter Jimenez. I uh, live in Gemini, I drive in Hillsborough. Nice to be back here. 
Uh, so I don't want to sound like I'm nagging or anything. It's just it's a long day. Everybody has long Mondays, long Tuesdays, seven days a week, long day. My point is we got to focus on the common good. And there's a lot of people who would agree that having access to these meetings virtually, even though we have the technology, we're not being, it's not being used right now. Um, and I just want to constantly push the board away to please have these meetings virtually. It means a ton. Again, I don't have any kids, but here I am after a long day, I just want to go take a nap. But we need to focus on things that we all agree and mean it. Uh, the county commissioners, one of the highlights they've made recently is that they never stop virtual meetings. They continue those meetings uh, and uh, they will do so until further notice and I hope they never do. Because one of the uh, things that uh, the superintendent was talking about is how to make the board of ed uh, better. How do we improve it? How do we make sure that the message goes out to a lot of people so there's less misinformation out there? Having these meetings virtual will help parents hear what's happening. Uh, I would watch this from home and I would comment from home I was, as I would do my dishes. Um, and a lot of parents, I don't have any kids, but I could imagine myself with two kids. I wouldn't be able to be here. I'll probably be home passed out with one of them in my arms while I rock the other one. So please have priority. I know that you all, everybody here has a lot in their plate, but please bring, out, bring back those meetings. Uh, I know that from a perspective of somebody who uh, can drive here and has a privilege. It might not seem like a high priority, but we shouldn't use our own life as a baseline to make decisions. So please make that, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Thank you for your public comments. Is there any other public comments? Tim Jordan, 201 Broke Our Court. Um, I do not have any children in the school district uh, anymore. Um, for some few people may recognize me, I've been at uh, many of these board meetings many years ago, Mr. Gillette, a couple other people. Um, I am not a, an advocate of this uh, uh, critical race theory, and I don't want it taught in our school system. I think it's a decisive piece of uh, a program that, that pits uh, you know, races against each other rather than bring them together. Um, I think that uh, racism in this country would be on life support if it wasn't for groups like supporting CRT and Black Lives Matters and Colin Kaepernick and all these other people, I think they fuel the flames of racism in this country. No one in this country is, is oppressed anymore. Think about that, what I just said. No one is oppressed. Anybody can go anywhere they want, any time of the day or night, literally. No one is oppressed. Everyone has the same opportunity in this country. And for someone like myself, who served in the military for 30 years, okay, I support that. And I think it's important that we understand that. And I think it's important that we know that this, these, these flames of, of, uh, of racism really don't exist, except for groups and programs that we have, like this critical race theory. I don't support it. I think it's ridiculous. Um, again, the only people that are opposed in this country, or, or oppressed in this country, are people that are lazy, the people who are ignorant, and the people who just don't want to participate. Everybody has equal rights in this country right now, today. We're not, we're not, we don't want to program critical race theory is going to pit races against each other. I don't want to see that. I don't want my tax dollars being spent on a program in the curriculum. Let's concentrate on STEM programs. Let's bring in more teachers. My question that I was going to ask before, I just was not sure what the student ratio was in the classroom. I'm, I'm not sure I was asking that, I was going to ask that question. It could be lower, but I don't want my tax dollars wasted on this critical race theory. And again, if anybody has a student in this school system and you believe that that is, is you know, like I believe that it's not something that we want to see in the school system, you better come to these meetings and stop it because this is the kind of thing that will drive a community apart instead of bringing it together. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. 
Is there any other comment? Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh. Uh, my name is Cheryl Barker. Um, I reside at 900H Merritt Drive, Hillsboro, New Jersey. Um, I'm here tonight to begin the discussion on changing the athletic policy, which doesn't allow homeschool students, share time students, the same opportunity as all other students in the district to play school sports. Um, we are all aware that the NJS IAA have adjusted their guidelines, which allow homeschool students to play sports with the approval of the school board. Um, every student in New Jersey should have that opportunity to do so. Um, so I think it's time that we discuss this policy and change it. Um, I'm a homeschool parent of three. Um, my son Brendan will be a freshman this year. He'll be doing a shared program for the Information Technology Project Lead, um, Lead the Way at Somerset County Tech High School. He has played football for five years with the Duke Football Ball administration or corporation. He loves the sport and he plays it well. And I'm sad and a little bit disappointed that he's not able to play as a freshman this year because of this policy. Um, it makes him ineligible. And I don't think it's fair to call a child or a student ineligible um, when homeschool students do exactly what public school students do. They learn um, through sports to be better people. As a taxpayer in Hillsborough, New Jersey, we should have the choice to play or not to play, even as a homeschool family, instead of that choice being made for us, for me and my family, because of the policy that's currently in place. If I'm paying taxes for a great school system, then why can't a homeschool family participate in that great homeschool system? Um, if we care about all students, as we say, then why not homeschool families not be considered as part of that, um, as all students? Um, we are aware that there are other, or we're in the process of looking at other counties to see um, what they do and how they make it work. Um, and I would like to discuss that with someone um, on how we can do that here in our district. It's a great, great district. We love Hillsboro. We've been here for 20 years. And um, I'm just sad to see that um, I can't um, have my son play a sport that he loves to do. Thank you. Thank you for your public comments. Is there any other comments? Uh, Phil Gans, 94 Marshall Road. Um, I'm the parent of an, of an elementary school student in the district. I come before you this evening to speak about masks in our schools this year. I understand the board is simply following guidance from the state and requiring masks for all students in the fall. But before we blindly follow directives from the state, perhaps we should examine the record of those issuing these directives. For the better part of the last 18 months, New Jersey has been one of the most locked down states in the entire country. Yet somehow Governor Murphy's policies have resulted in this state having the worst death rate per capita in the entire country. That is 50th out of 50. He literally could not have done worse if he tried. Our children were locked out of school to, due to this governor's policies and missed significant amounts of learning due to a virus which has been proven over and over simply to not be deadly to otherwise healthy children. In fact, more children typically die of the flu than have died of COVID. Yet prior to 2020, no one suggested children should wear masks and close down schools due to the flu. This board was not elected, and Dr. Antunes was not hired to do the easy and comfortable things. You were elected and hired to do the hard things. I call on you to do what other districts in this state have done, for example, Wall Township, and push back on this governor and petition him to drop these top-down mandates and allow parents to do what is best for their children including making the decision whether or not their child wears a mask at school. I am tired of watching my child come home from school with a wet, dirty mask on her face and complaining of headaches on a daily basis. Not only is masking of low-risk, healthy children unnecessary, it is impeding their development, including the ability to build healthy friendships through school since they're being taught to be afraid of one another. In another time and place, this would be considered child abuse. In 2021, we call it school. 
the people most qualified to make decisions about what is best for my children live in my house, not the governor's mansion. I call on you to stand up tonight and push back against the failed policies of a failed governor rather than go along because it's the easy thing to do. It's time this board and Dr. Antunas stand up for our children, even if it's uncomfortable. Thank you. Thank you for your public comments. Is there any other comments? Hi, I'm Jessica Easton, 5 Fernway. I agree with what he said. First of all, I just want to second that. Um, but I do have a couple questions or just some things to consider about um, the situation with school. Um, so I understand there are certain situations where masks will be exempt. And I, I would like to request that at the elementary level especially, the teachers can somehow tell these kids when it's okay. Because I'll tell you what, my kids are terrified to take their mask off. And that's, they're outside, they're not next to anybody, they should be allowed to take their mask off. Um, I, just, I just think there should be some guidance given to the younger kids when it's okay. And it should not be left up to a five, six, seven, eight year old to decide, I'm gonna go against the rules and take my mask off. They don't know the difference. So that's the first request I have. Um, and the second thing is when they're quarantining and there's no uh, support or no, it's all asynchronous, what about the kids with IEPs? I mean, my daughter sat on the floor crying when she had no support from her teacher. So I, I just think there should be some consideration for the kids with IEPs, especially when they're quarantined. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there any other comments? Good afternoon, Mark Stachina from Hillsborough. Uh, basically, I just want to try to, if this board, this community, this town, if they could somehow put a request to the governor to somehow, it seems like there's a uh, prohibition against if you're vaccinated or you're not vaccinated, but you could be vaccinated or unvaccinated and had a prior infection of coronavirus. Um, if you want to look at recently published May 21st, 2021, in nature, they talk about SARS-CoV-2 infection, induced long-lived bone marrow plasma cells in humans. Um, I, I, could, I could get this to you if you need this. But uh, basically, if you had prior infection of corona, especially if you had it recently with Delta. So if I had a past cro uh, infection of corona, CoV-2, I would have lifetime immunity in my B, my B cells, their memory B cells, they're in your bone marrow, they are in there for your, for your life. It was recently published, like I said, in Nature, may have been on the CDC website, but if we're saying, hey, you're vaccinated, you're good to go, if you're not vaccinated and you have had a prior infection, well, you're not good to go. That's not true. We knew that to be true, this proved it. It's almost like going through buds, right? Basic underwater demolition seals, you're always a seal. You just have to prove it. So we did prove that. This is published. Um, there's actually two cases in there. This one also, and I researched this. This came out in 2008. So I know some people have amnesia in 2021. This is a SIDRAP. It's called Centers for Infect Infectious Disease Research and Policy. It's at a, based out of University of Minnesota. Uh, the guy that runs this, Michael Olsterholm, excellent. He wrote a book called Deadliest Enemy. If you have not read that, I recommend you do. Probably go to about chapter 13, it'll say China. Uh, researchers found long-lived immunity to the 1918 pandemic virus. So Spanish flu 1918 lasted for X number of years. The numbers are all over the board from 20 million to 100 million. I'm not sure how they tested for that in 1918. But um, they did research recently in, two th in the 2000s, probably 2006, 2007. This was published 2008. They tested people who are over 90 that at the time in 1918, they were between two and 12 years old. When they tested them, they found out that they had C uh, memory B cells memory from the old Spanish flu from 1918.
from 1918. This is published by uh, Tisbin, Macra, and Exxon. <coughs> Sorry if I'm mis misrepresenting Mr. Sachina, your yes. three minutes are up. If you could just wrap it up. Three minutes. I'll be here all day. <coughs> all right. So if we can, number one, if we, uh, I'll send you this. But if you had prior infection, you are immune for the most part, like any other vaccine, especially if I had recently Delta, because the <laughs> Pfizer and Moderna were tested with the Alpha and Beta, they were never tested against the Delta. You actually have more immunity if you have just had Corona. The face mask, thank, or thank face you, covering. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Uh, my wife lives in, in also in Hillsborough. Could I have her three minutes? No. My son, my daughter. No. All right, so you're going to have to throw me out. Thank All right, you, here Mr. we go. Zuchina. Face mask, just Mr. the coverings Mr. of the Zuchina? face mask. I understand. Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Zuchina, your three minutes are up. There are other right, people so who would like to speak. i drag my wife and my kids in here. If All they're right, here, they may speak for themselves. Right. Thank you, Mr. Zuchina. Is there any other so public comments? One more second. If, my, uh, if I have children that are under 18, can they speak here? Absolutely, if okay, they're here. So, so anybody that's under 18 and, and has a IQ over 70, that's a practical reasoner. So you're going to have anybody come in here to speak about anything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your public comments. Is there any other public comment? Janine Mason, I reside at 211 Valley Road. Um, I would like to start off by saying that I agree with every single comment that has been made by the community this evening. If anybody thinks CRT is not in our schools, it is. I have a copy of the curriculum that was approved in August 2020 along with me. You can certainly grab a copy of it. In addition to that, the masks as parents, I feel it's our choice for what we want our children to do. They are not at risk. I agree with everything everybody said. But I do have a question. If the, I'm curious if the teachers in our um, school system will be utilizing the REACH app that was suggested by the NG, NJEA and the NEA um, a couple Tuesdays ago in August. Does anybody know if the teachers will be using that app? Excuse me, Ms. Basin, this is not a question and answer session. You may make your public comment. Okay, well, in case you don't know what that is, it's an app where um, there is an app called Reach. It's for teachers to use to record their conversations with individuals. The purpose of the Zoom was to teach teachers how to speak to others who are not vaccinated and trying to convince them to be vaccinated, whether it be students who are of age, parents, or even their friends. When a teacher has a conversation with somebody using the prompts that this training gave them, they go into this app called Reach, type in the person's name, and pull them up. If it's an adult, their name should be in the database. And if they're a child, they can add that name and the database. When I say child, I mean those who are old enough to be vaccinated, 12 years old. The teacher marks down if they're vaccinated, not vaccinated, thinking of getting vaccinated, et cetera, from different options, and then submits the information to this company. They want the teachers to follow up with anybody who is unvaccinated a week or two later to see if they went and got the shot. Every time a teacher enters information into the app, they get points. And every so often, the people who are on the leaderboards get $250 gift cards. And the purpose of this is to facilitate conversations between teachers and parents and students of age to be vaccinated. The main point of this is that the training was that teachers are a trusted profession and that is why you do not need to be a medical expert to give vaccine advice and parents will trust what you have to say because you are, what you are their teacher. And I have screenshots of the app and the um, Zoom meeting from this NJEA meeting about awarding teachers for violating HIPAA laws and asking questions about vaccines and pushing the vaccine mandates. I just wanted to
to know if any of the teachers were using that application. I asked at the Q&A session, and apparently nobody was aware of it, but it was an NJEA Zoom meeting, so I don't Thank quite you. Thank understand you, Ms. Basin, that. for your public comment. Are um, my three minutes up? Your three minutes are up. Thank you. Is, is there any other public comments? Seeing none, then I will now close public comments and turn it over to the board for any comment or discussion. Ms. Statz and then Ms. Stermarini. I just wanted to talk about um, an event that I attended uh, on August 7th. Um, it was called Beyond Borders, a multicultural festival, and it took place at the municipal building. And it was organized by the Student Diversity Initiative, which is a, a club uh, at Hillsborough High School. Um, they had all kinds of food and artwork. The artwork was amazing. Um, and tables that addressed a variety of issues related to diversity and different cultures. And they also had uh, workshops that demonstrated various talents. While I was there, they had um, uh, demonstrations of hip hop and Ukrainian dance, and they invited people, uh, the, the attendees, to participate. And I'll reassure my my friends and former colleagues, I did not participate because I have no sense of rhythm, <coughs> and they can vouch for that. Um, but it was it was it's amazing what our students can accomplish. I mean, they they pretty much organized all this and ran it themselves. It was very enjoyable, um, and such a variety of uh, artwork, like I said, and uh, uh, demonstrations of their their knowledge and skills and talents. So, and I, and I ran into Mr. Hill there, and uh, I think I see some people here that, that were also at that event. So it was such a positive experience. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stats, Mr. Marini, and then Mr. Pulsifer. Yes, um, just in regards to one of the speakers tonight who was referring to homeschool students and athletics, um, I would like to make a motion for a vote to approve to have homeschool students, residents of Hillsborough, to actually be able to participate in Hillsborough sports. I would like to second that walk-on motion. I, we're not going to um, meet for another month. It will, the student would miss. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't. I, I think the board should be able to vote on that tonight. So, Mr. Marini, I see a first and a second. However, um, with all due respect, with this, the, typically the processes that our board functions through committee. So, I would refer to the education committee for discussion. I did do some research after we received Ms. Barker's email, and there, there was a robust discussion several years ago when this topic had been brought up with homeschool, and there are many, many reasons why the board at the time adopted the policy to exclude the homeschool students. However, respectfully, if you would like to discuss that, it would best go through Education Committee. Uh, we'll be allowed to do a temporary kind of allowance for the student. Unfortunately, no, because of the legal legal opinion at the time that if we were to, so it is policy, but also if we were to make one exception, that basically negates the entire policy. Mm. I so. mean, for the, for the sake of time, is this something we can discuss tonight? Does this have to be done in education? Not, not in public, here? no. What about if the majority of board members would like to discuss it? It is not, it is not best practice for us to discuss We're not this. asking best practice. We're asking for, for the sense of time is, you know, can this be talked about? Okay, um, I will now refer to Mr. Lapira. So, so, oh, sorry. So in terms of, you know, what you can and can't do, certainly if you review the policy and propose a policy change and then have a first reading, you can do that. It's still not going to go into effect until you have a second reading because you have to do that to change your policies. You currently have a policy that prohibits it. You can change that policy. There's no question about it. But um, I think as Mr. Hugh was saying, normally you have that reviewed and, and there's a discussion about it and then if there's a recommendation, they bring that to the board. Now, what you're talking about doing tonight, I, I'm assuming, is um, not having the discussion piece or having the discussion as the entire board, but then doing a first reading. And of course, you, I don't have the policy in front of me right now, but you do have a policy that prohibits it. I do remember looking at it within the last couple of weeks. Um, and you'd have to change it to specifically allow homeschooled students to participate 
in extracurricular athletics, which you could do. Again, it's still not going to go into effect until you have your second reading, whenever your next board meeting is, even if you do that tonight. Um, but that, that's what can be done. But I, the only thing that I would say, and this is up to you as a board, as to how you want to proceed, is whether or not you want to proceed um, just by making the motion tonight and having the first reading, or reviewing all the information that, you're, that you normally review as part of a committee um, to determine, okay, is this something that we want to change? Um, but that's a board level decision in terms of how you make that determination, right? Normally, you go through the committee, you, the committee makes a recommendation, oh, we should change this policy, which is normal and fine. Um, and that's typically the way that you do it. Are you prohibited legally from having a discussion tonight and having a first reading? No, but that's just not the way we typically, I mean, you know, in years and years and years, we haven't done it that way. But that doesn't mean it's impossible to do. I want to be clear. We're not prepared to have that conversation. That may be an issue. We are not prepared to have this conversation this evening. It seems like, and I know that we try to prepare ourselves the best we can, but sometimes we're under time constraints. And sometimes it's great to just have these conversations in front of the public in a board meeting versus in one specific committee um, with a lot. I mean, if the community is asking for this, I think wherever we have it, having it at the next board meeting, if we um, need to, so our choices are to ask for a motion to have a first reading and discussion or to wait to, to the, a committee meeting, is, is that correct? So, Ms. Nurse, if we were to have a first reading tonight, we'd actually have to have wording for that. We'd need to pull up the policy and have wording. I think it's unfair to the administration, who has not had time to prepare and give the board background information, to have this discussion. When this discussion came up previously, there was a very robust discussion in education. There are many items that I'm not prepared to say in public right now. Um, so I would respectfully request that we defer to the Education Committee, of which, Paul, Mr. Marini, you are a member. Um, so that would be... So this is not operations, this is education. education. Edu it would be education. And we can have it at a board meeting, just we're not prepared to have that sure, this evening. Sure, sure. Ms. Stats. I'm, a, I'm very much a person that likes to follow rules. But at least we do have a first and a second reading. And in the interest of time, and we can argue about, well, then this should have been brought up sooner, but we can't turn the clock back. Um, I don't know what damage could, it could be to at least have a first reading now. Ms. Stats. It's not, it wouldn't be binding. Ms. Stats, it's, I understand what you're saying. However, the administration has not had an opportunity to weigh in on the board, with the board members on this topic. And as I had said to Mr. Marini earlier, when I did review the legal opinion that was attached to the previous discussion, the board attorney at the time strongly recommended that the board adopt the policy as it was adopted. So I think it would be not in the district's best interest to move forward to the first reading tonight. So seeing as how there's a motion on the table, Oh, Mr. Pulsifer, please. Well, the other, the other problem I have is I'm not even sure what we're, I mean, we can discuss this all we want, but if we're talking about having a first reading, we need a edited full policy. And I'm not, personally, I'm not prepared to have that uh, official, we can discuss all we want, but have that official step when I haven't even gone into detail on the existing policy. Um, I, I don't want to rush a change. I mean, we can't just sit here and say, okay, uh, you know, your motion was to allow this, but what does allow this mean? How exactly do we rewrite the policy to create the effect that you're asking for? And that requires review by the administration and board members to have look at the old policy and figure out what we want the new policy to say. Um, it's not as easy. I know to the public it's like, yes, just let kids do it. But it's not that easy when we talk about actually having to write a legally binding policy. So we need to have that effort from our either from our legal representation or from Charles Sesme, along with our administration, to actually look at our old policy and figure out what that new policy should look like before we actually could even, where I would even be comfortable saying a first reading. Because I can't, a first reading of what? I have no policy in front of me that I'm reading. So to say we're having a first reading when I haven't even seen a rewritten policy, um, regardless of what we can discuss tonight, I have no problem. 
no problem with that. But to call it a first reading when I don't even have a policy to read, um, I think really is, is stretching the process. Thank you, Mr. Pulsifer. Ms. Maroon? No, I, uh, um, I, I agree with Chris. I mean, I'm not saying I'm for or against or either one. I would like to explore it. I would like to discuss the options. But again, I don't think going full-blown into a policy and, and doing something tonight is going to be helpful, again, because the, of the logistics of not seeing the policy, not knowing what we can change, what should change, what and, and, and just me doing the due diligence of making sure we get all of the information on every aspect and every side of the issue at hand. So, and that's just, just me personally, that I just want to do my due diligence and research and talk to community members and talk to, you know, other districts that may or may not have this policy and just, you know, see to do our due diligence and get the get our facts straight and get everything ready so that if we are prepared to to do this as a reading which i, I may or may not be i'm not just saying we are ready to to roll it out thank properly. you Ms. thank you Ms. maroon mr marini so i just want to be sure then that we have an education committee prior to the next board meeting so that we can be prepared for that because i do not think we have our next one i think is september 15th so I so our next for this September, so we have moved committee meetings to before the first board meeting of the month, except for September because of the reopening of schools. So the education committee meeting will be between the two board meetings. So now it's three board meetings out before this could be approved. Yes. That's correct. Yes, Mr. Oliver. I, I just, you know, I have a problem with that because it's like perfection is getting in the way of progress. And who are we hurting? We're hurting the student. He's going to miss the entire athletic season. We wouldn't be able to approve this until October at best. So, again, I'm going to, I'm going to press. We have a motion and a second on the floor. Let the board vote. If it's defeated, it's defeated. But, but I think if we got a first reading on the agenda for tonight, the administration could fine tune it for the second reading and we could have it approved the next board meeting. It might salvage that student season. You know, I, can I, um, Ms. Stats and then Ms. Nurse. Um, it's been brought up that, you know, we haven't read it, but uh, just this agenda alone, there are two items that we haven't read and we voted on. Motion to submit uh, the 2021-2022 Statement of Assurance for a District Professional Development Plan and also the Statement of Assurance for a District Mentoring Plan. I think that was made available to the Education Committee today, but I think for the most part, most uh, board members have not read all that. So we do vote on things that we haven't read. And this, this would just be a verse, first reading. It would not be binding. Ms. Stats, um, just in response to that, the policy, like the board is a policy-making body, right? So we should read all of the policy and be informed by our administration. With respect to the statement of assurance, the Education Committee did receive the two copies that you mentioned. The entire board did not. I don't recall that the board requested that information. That is just a statement of assurance. That is the administration doing the daily business of the district. So, um, Mr. Lapierre, oh, Ms. Ms. Nurse. You know, I agree, Jane. I, I was looking for those documents. I, I just assumed that it was part of the procedure. We as a board are working on communication. So we're not putting pointing fingers at administration or, or anybody. As a full board, including board members and administrators, we are continuing to work to um, be cohesive in our communication and, and what we need. So I, I think we're doing a great job. I think we're going in the right direction. I too um, liked the motion at first, but I, I do understand the other side of being prepared. Well, Cheryl, I read your email and I thought it was a great idea. It was something that I wanted to explore, but in hearing everybody else and, and wanting to have the knowledge and the background of what decisions were made before. I think, you know, unfortunately the timing and getting the email at this time, it, it is hard to have everything set for September. Um, so at least from what we saw as, as the board, I'm not sure if that conversation started before this time, but as a board, I think to do the due diligence of slowing down, yeah. taking, you know, it took, it took me a second to like, Take a breath, take a beat, um, and, and, and make sure that we have all of the information that we need before we pr uh, progress and move forward. I do recommend or hope that the Education Committee will put that as a top um, part on their agenda 
to begin those discussions at the next meeting. Thank you, Ms. Nurse. Is there any other comment? Mr. Lapira. Yeah, if I may, just one comment, without getting into details of any specific situations, um, but I do know that there's a couple of things to consider as well, um, because we were asked for a legal opinion on the ability of the student to participate, or any student to participate, um, based upon the current policy. But there also are additional complications, because I believe that the way the NJSIAA rules contemplate it, it's fully homeschooled students, not partially. Um, and so there may be complications in terms of can we even permit it if we have someone who t attends a public high school that has a sports team and they attend it part time. I think my current interpretation of the NJSIA rules say that that's the place where that person has to play uh, the sport. But again, it's, it, 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 it looks very simple on the surface. It's actually a little bit complex. And I think that you probably should review that in terms of determining um, what decision that you ultimately make. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of a policy, by, by, you know, by no means, I mean, the board can certainly determine, yes, we want homeschool students to be able to participate in sports, or, or no, we don't. Whatever you determine is your policy choice, but I just want to make sure that you're making an informed decision based upon um, the policy overall, and then the policy as it applies to specific students in specific situations, which may still have issues. If, if I made myself clear, I don't. I hope I didn't make it <laughs> unclear. But that was the, the goal. Thank you, Mr. Lapira. Mr. Marini, you made the motion. I re respectfully request if so how does that work? If uh, you would withdraw the motion, or you know, do we postpone it? All right, I, I can rescind, and we can. Uh, I would ask to do our best to move up the next operation as an education committee to before that. I don't know if that's possible. Yeah, Mr. Marini, we, when, we, when we plan these meetings, we were trying to do what the board asked us to do, but it's the first week of school. I, I understand. We, we just, it's almost impossible for us to be prepared for the, we're, we're it's, I just don't want to put any administrator, any central office staff under that. It's, it's just impossible for us to do. And I'm, typically we would move mountains. I just, I can't promise that. Okay, I, I just understood. can't at this point. Thank you, Mr. Marini. So we have rescinded that motion, yes, that and exists, we and are adding it to Ms. Maroon, if you are okay with that, with the Education Committee agenda. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to have it on there. Thank you very much, Ms. Maroon. Ms. Ms. Nurse. Do you want to still comment on Oh, no, it's something new. So, I, so, so do I. Um, the gentleman who discussed the, the virtual options to keep board meetings like almost a hybrid. I, I believe he was a gentleman who spoke before about this. Um, I think it is a great idea to explore. I'm not sure what committee that needs to start in, um, but I would like to see that on the agenda of the committee that it, that's most appropriate for. Thank you, Ms. Maroon. I will discuss that with the superintendent at our meetings. Thank okay. you. Mr. Pulsifer. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, Mr. LaPera, but You've had a good answer so far. Um, through the course of the last year and a half, uh, we have often heard, and we heard again tonight, um, we hear about recommendations uh, and guidance. And often what we hear from the public, um, at least what I hear from the public, is why are you following so-and-so guidance and why are you doing this and that. But a number of the things that are coming our way are not guidance. They're not recommendations. I believe they have the force of law. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment and help us all understand the public and the board but which aspects of this are potentially you know, guidance from the State Department of Health or Hillsborough Department of Health versus uh, orders that have weight of law and therefore we're obligated to follow. And I, I worry when, I, when the public says, why are you following this guidance? Well, it's not guidance, I don't, I don't believe it's guidance, it's law and we follow it because we're a governing body and we're obligated to follow the law. But I wish you could potentially clear that up. That's a valid and a good question. Um, so with respect specifically to masking, because that has come up in many school districts, not just Hillsboro. Um, so Executive Order 251 does require um, masking in all public, private, parochial, preschool and K through 12 school programs. Um, it's that specifically, that masking requirement is not guidance, that is the law. Um, it's an executive order which has the force of law. Um, technically speaking, violating an executive order um, uh, can be determined to be a disorderly person's offense that, surprisingly maybe, um, is subject to 
imprisonment for a term not to exceed six months or a fine not to exceed $1,000. So it does have the effect of law. There is a statute that says if you defy an, an executive order of the governor, um, that can be the penalty. So, so with respect to the masking requirement that came out on August 9th, yes, at the current time, that is the law. We are required to uh, abide by it. It goes through a different process to be sure than how laws normally come about in our state. Normally it's a bill that is approved by both um, the Assembly and the Senate, and then it goes to the governor and the governor signs it. Um, but the governor does have certain emergency powers, um, which were even recognized recently, uh, probably I guess a couple of months ago, when a lot of the executive orders were rescinded, um, but it still recognized the ability of the governor to issue those executive orders. And yes, Executive Order 251 does have the force and effect of law, and we are required to abide by it. That, that in and of itself is not a guideline. There may be other um, things that are out there that are guidelines, but this one is not. Thank you. I, I just think it's important. I think we should be part of it. People have asked that we be, you know, be part of conversations, and I think we should continue to be part of conversations with our local and state government about the best way to handle the different scenarios. But the fact of the matter is that uh, and until and if that executive order or anything else with legal, the weight of law changes, for now we're still obligated to follow that rule regardless of what conversations may be going on and what we may be trying to accomplish through other channels, we still are obligated to follow that law. That's correct. Until it changes, we're obligated to follow it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pulsifer. Thank you, Mr. Lapira. Any other comments from the board? Mr. Oliver. So I, I just wanted to make a comment. I, I want to, you know, we had a rare, very good, robust public discussion here tonight. I want to thank everyone in attendance for their comments this evening. I especially want to thank everyone for wearing their masks. I know a lot of us don't want to be wearing these masks in these meetings, but, but as Mr. Lapera said, it is a requirement. We can lose state funding. The governor has issued a mandate. We're in a school. We need to wear these masks. Um, we all have very different opinions, very heated opinions, very passionate opinions about this. There are children. Uh, it breaks my heart when I hear parents talking to their preschool children and, and grade school children that, that are struggling with coming to school and wearing these masks and crying and complaining of headaches and migraines and they have doctor's notes, but yet the state mandate requires them to have these masks on. Um, if I had grammar school children in school, I'd be very passionate about it as well. But I want to thank everyone for being very respectful and following the guidance tonight and sticking to their, to their opinions very professionally. Um, you know, the CRT is another, you know, if you're watching the news, right, it's a very hot button. And again, you know, if I had the option, I'd probably opt my children out of that. Um, you know, my grandparents came to this country at 18 years of age. My grandfather came from Sicily. Um, he was persecuted. He was prejudiced. Uh, he lived to the ripe old age of 98. My grandmother was 102. Um, it, it is the land of opportunity. Um, you know, it, it's a lot different than it was 100 years ago. We, we've made great strides. Uh, but, but, but the point is, is that we're your elected officials up here. We're here to represent you. Um, be passionate. Be professional. Be respectful about your opinions. And we hear you. Um, you need to write your legislatures, you need to write your congressmen, you need to write your senators if you don't believe in what's going on. We are, in a lot of ways, powerless. Um, you know, it's an executive order. A year and a half, we're still living this. And it's not going away. And it is getting worse. Um, but, but, you know, trust, trust me that, you know, let's be respectful. Let's get through this together. And uh, again, from the bottom of my heart, I thank everyone for being professional and courteous this evening. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. I just wanted to address one point, Mr. Oliver, about critical race theory. And I will share this with the board. New Jersey School Boards Association has sent out a frequently asked questions about this. Critical race theory is not required by the New Jersey Student Learning Standards, and it is not being taught in schools. So I will share this with, with the board, and we can have perhaps a discussion in committee. So thank you. Is there any other comment from the board? Seeing none, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you very much. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We are adjourned, and we will see you back on September 13th.
Okay, thank you very much.